Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. My name is Kristen Spragna. I'm the Lunch Poems Coordinator, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you here. This is the, our last reading of the semester. I know it's a busy time for everyone. Um, please be sure to sign up on our mailing list so you'll be reminded about our spring readings. On February 5th, we have Thomas Shalomin coming. He's a Slovenian poet, and we're really lucky to have him here. And Gary Snyder is coming in March. And in April, we have a very special event with five women poets coming from Korea. And then, of course, we end the year in May with our student reading. So I hope to see you all at all of those events. Um, I also want to remind everybody about our new fiction series, Story Hour in the Library, it happens on second Thursday. So that's next Thursday. Just across the way in 190 Doe, we'll have Sylvia Brownrig here. So please join us for that at 5 p.m. And now I give to you Robert Hess, who will introduce our reader today, Tracy K. Smith. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome Tracy Smith here. She um, grew up, or at least partly grew up, in Northern California. And she actually worked for a period in the, in the Bancroft Library. So we're, in a way, welcoming, welcoming one of our own back, though we didn't uh, uh, get her at Berkeley. In fact, she, I'm afraid she uh, got a Stegner Fellowship and spent time at Stanford. For, uh, <laughs> She went to uh, Harvard and to Columbia. She did work at Stanford, and she's published two enormously striking books. Uh, one of the things that's unusual about them is that their titles are actually sort of what they're about. Um, the first book was called The Body's Questions. It's a book about um, the body's questions. Uh, <clears throat> it's quite gorgeous. Um, Saudage. Um, uh, the uh, longings of, uh, for place, for love, for order, for a morally comprehensible universe are in that book. The means tend to be um, uh, understated. There's a sense in the poems, and she articulates in the poems, the power of waiting to hear what the poem has to say. Um, and Duende seemed to me, when I saw the title, like, oh, that would be the next place to go from the questions that desire and longing and, and the nature of language provoke in you to a, a, more, a fiercer version of that. And when I opened the book <clears throat> uh, and started to look through it, the, the thing that was most striking is what is the, what dark historical material she goes to in the book. In, in a, let me let me begin. I, I don't want to take a lot of time. I want you to hear her, but let me read you just a bit of what she has to say about um, Duende, which was of course Federico Garcia Lorca's borrowing of a of a musicians concept, an Egyptian concept, to talk about where poetry comes from. This is Tracy Smith. We read poems because they change us, and our reasons for writing them hover around that same fact. A poem, a good poem, speaks to and from a place that belongs to us, that, that elusive pitch of being some might call the soul, the psyche, the sub or unconscious. We believe it's there because we feel it working but we're powerless to tell it when or how or even why to work. Surely, as poets, most of us have discovered ways of letting go enough to embolden whatever it is that sends words and questions and inklings out from that space. I, it's worth reading that sentence twice because it gives you a sense of the subtle and intense qualities of her intelligence. That elusive pitch of being some might call the soul, the psyche, the sub or unconscious. We believe it's there because we feel it working, but we're powerless to tell it when or how or even why to work. 
Surely as poets, most of us have discovered ways of letting go enough to embolden whatever it is that sends words and questions and inklings out from that space. And the best readers know that that place is where poems go when they hit us hard, teach us, reach home. The Spanish poet Federico Garcia Lorca named the keeper of that space the duende, daemon, hobgoblin, mischief maker, guardian of, he quote, she quotes Lorca, the mystery, the roots fastened in the mire that we all know and all ignore. Unlike the muse or angel, which exists beyond or above the poet, the duende sleeps deep within the poet and asks to be awakened and wrestled, often at great cost. Please welcome Tracy Smith. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really thrilled to be here because it really does feel like kind of coming home in a way and um, excited to see some familiar faces in the audience. So um, I thought I would start with a few poems from Duende. I actually feel like I now have to because I forgot to bring a copy of the book with me and then my family went on this uh, chase tracking down their copies that they had lent out. And so I have a copy now and only to see that there are stacks of them right there. Um, but I will mm, begin with the title poem. And um, this poem, there are a couple of moments where uh, quotations from flamenco songs come in, and maybe they will be apparent. Duende. The earth is dry, and they live wanting, each with a small reservoir of furious music heavy in the throat. They drag it out, and with nails in their feet, coax the night into being. Brief believing, a skirt shimmering with sequins and lies. And in this night that is not night, each word is a wish, each phrase a shape their bodies ache to fill. I'm going to braid my hair, braid many colors into my hair. I'll put a long braid in my hair and write your name there. They defy gravity to feel tugged back, the clatter, the mad slap of landing. And not just them, not just the ramshackle family, the tios primitos, not just the bailaor whose heels have notched and hammered time so the hours flow in place like a tin river, marking only what once was. Not just the voices scraping against the river, nor the hands nudging them farther, fingers like blind birds, palms empty, echoing. Not just the women with sober faces and flowers in their hair, the ones who dance as though they're burying memory one last time beneath them. And I hate to do it here to set myself heavily beside them. Not now that they've proven the body a myth, parable for what not even language moves quickly enough to name. If I call it pain and try to touch it with my hands, my own life, it lies still and the music thins, a pulse felt for through garments. If I lean into the desire it starts from, if I lean unbuttoned into the blow of loss after loss, love tossed into the ecstatic void, it carries me with it farther, to chords that stretch and bend like light through colored glass. But it races on toward shadows where the world I know and the world I fear threaten to meet. There is always a road, the sea, dark hair, dolor, always a question bigger than itself. They say you're leaving Monday. Why can't you leave on Tuesday? Um, the more I started thinking about that concept of duende, um, the more it 
it really became for me kind of a synonym for survival and maybe resistance also. Not only because the um, usually the groups of people that are responsible for the folk traditions that we associate with terms like that are marginalized and, and are kind of holding on to a culture that's being threatened by maybe a larger culture. Um, but also because I, I really think that the the most creativity that we we have kind of comes out when we need it most and um, I just started thinking about so many different aspects of our everyday life um, as citizens where that kind of um, determination comes out so that's I think what really began to take shape as this this book developed so I'll read um, a poem called slow burn which I think is kind of like a domestic duende slow burn We tend toward the danger at the center, soft core teeming blue with fire. We tend toward what will singe and flare, but coil back when brought near. Sometimes we read about people pushed there and left to recover. They don't. Come out mangled or not at all. Minds flayed by visions no one can fathom. I have a cousin who haunts the basement of my aunt's house, drinking her liquor. The air around him is cold, and he swings at it, working himself into a sweat, like a boxer or an addict. Sometimes he comes upstairs to eat her food, feeding the thing inside him. We laugh, thinking laughter will make us safe. Then we go home and lie down in our lives. Sometimes, when my thoughts won't sit still, I imagine Marcus down there, awake in the dark, hands fisted in his lap, or upturned, open, in what might be a kind of prayer. I'm certain the same thing dragging his heart drags ours, only he's not afraid to name it, can call it up into the room and swear at it, or let it rest there on the couch beside him till his head slumps onto his chest and the TV bruises the walls with unearthly light. Uh, This poem is called Theft, and I'm just going to read you the the epigraph. It's based on an interview that I read several years ago with a man named John Dahl. Um, And... In 1963, John Dahl, a Ho-Chunk Indian, was taken from his mother's home as part of a federal project to reduce poverty in Native American communities. He moved from foster home to foster home, haunted by recurring dreams and unsure of his own history. Years later, he was located by members of his tribe. And I think it was actually something like 20 years later. Um, And the word Ho-Chunk means people of the big voice. Theft. The world shatters through mother's black hair. I breathe smoke, tincture of sudden berries. Mother covers my eyes, but this heat is inside. It trickles out, a map of hot tears across my face, and rivers, my own rivers, pushing out from the desert between my legs. Frantic birds lift off, and their flight takes me. I float above dark thickets, thick air, above voices that rush and rise, a mad cloak. Sirens in my mother's mouth, sirens in the far corners of the flat black globe. I wake again and again, ears ringing, eyes dry. One night, when our bellies groan, I quiet myself, watching bare branches scratch against the moon. If night has a voice, it is surely this wind in these trees, is surely mother's heavy shoes, climbing the steps, trampling leaves. I'm the only one who knows what that voice means to say. It is trying to tell us to hurry, but it does not say for what. One brother twirls a pencil over a notebook. Answers he's erased hover like stalled ghosts. He shakes his head, 
all wrong. Another laughs at the TV. We are many, each in his own now. I've never thought to cross from mine to theirs, but I've held my hand inches from my brother's back and felt his heat. A knock at the door. The walls cough. Again. And mother doesn't ignore it. I feel what the moon must feel for the branches night after night. This can't go on. Come in. Then I watch our house come undone, and mother get smaller, and the road ahead like a serpent racing into pitch. In the station, we get blankets and a civics lesson. We get split up. All night, the drunks and devils sing, rattle. I live in the house behind the chain link fence, with smoke stenciling the sky above the roof, in a room with three boys and a window that wheezes winter. I wear my hair shorn. The mother here leans against the kitchen counter, scrubbing forks and bowls, staring into steam. If you interrupt her, she'll surprise you with an elbow, the back of her hand. Her fist squeaks in yellow gloves. I live in Chicago, in America. We have rules. Don't flush unless necessary, and only four squares of tissue a day, two in the morning, two at night, or all at once, but just four, and someone is counting. When you brush, turn the water on once, then off, then on again. Say sir and ma'am, but only when necessary. Otherwise, don't talk, and don't stare. What are you, stupid? And what kind of Indian are you? What kind? If you don't know, you must not be. This is my eighth home. I am seven. When I skip school, I get on the L and scour the city from inside, from above. I listen to the iron percussion, track soldered to track, a story that turns and returns, refuses to end. I ride it, write it down. I'm in my seat in the first car, a hologram in the window, in the battered doors, a stick figure in the chrome poles. I reach for myself, grab me by the neck. What do I hear? Time. What does it say? I can't tell. What does it sound like? It sounds angry. Why angry? Because we keep it waiting. When it's not waiting, it is always begging us to go. I get off the train, walk backwards over bridges, watch perspective diminish, watch my breath, my ideas hover and drift in perfect clouds. They'll drop eventually, mingle with a river or lake, might even one day make it back to me as rain maybe, or a tall glass I drink quickly, blind with thirst. I shout my name into the traffic, and if my voice is big enough, someone will hear it. It will land where it needs to land, and someone will catch it and come looking. Um, so I'm going to share some newer work. Um, one of the things that I find that I've been thinking about lately is um, the genre of science fiction. And um, I don't know, it seems almost like a perfect metaphor for American life in a way. Um, and um, I guess the loneliness and unknowability of space is um, something that, um, since I don't know that much about science, I'm, I'm trying to figure out ways of understanding by way of aspects of everyday life that I do feel like I understand. So that's what's happening in these next several poems. Um, Sci-fi. There will be no edges, but curves. Clean lines pointing only forward. History, with its hard spine and dog-eared corners, will be replaced with nuance, just like the dinosaurs gave way to mounds and mounds of ice. Women will still be women, but the distinction will be empty. Sex, having outlived every threat, will gratify only the mind, 
which is where it will exist. For kicks, we'll dance for ourselves before mirrors studded with golden bulbs. The oldest among us will recognize that glow, but the word sun will have been reassigned to a standard uranium neutralizing device found in households and nursing homes. And yes, we'll live to be much older thanks to popular consensus. Weightless, unhinged, eons from even our own moon will drift in the haze of space, which will be once and for all scrutable and safe. The universe is a house party. The universe is expanding. Look, postcards and panties, bottles with lipstick on the rim, orphan socks and napkins dried into knots. Quickly, wordlessly, all of it whisked into file with radio waves from a generation ago, drifting to the edge of what doesn't end, like the air inside a balloon. Is it bright? Will our eyes crimp shut? Is it molten, atomic, a conflagration of suns? It sounds like the kind of party your neighbors forget to invite you to. Bass throbbing through walls and everyone thudding around drunk on the roof. We grind lenses to an impossible strength, point them toward the future, and dream of beings will welcome with indefatigable hospitality. How marvelous you've come. We won't flinch at the pinprick mouths, the nubbin limbs. We'll rise, grassle, robust. Mi casa es tu casa, never more sincere. Seeing us, they'll know exactly what we mean. Of course it's ours. If it's anyone's, it's ours. The universe is a wedding. Or maybe we're the ones no one expected to show. Cousins by marriage, twice removed, narcoleptic colleagues, the ham-fisted, cleft-tongued, those with nowhere to go who prefer to stay home, knitting or tatting, living out whole impossible scenarios by a watery TV screen light. We've come anyway eager for a slice of cake, eager to get dressed, get out of the house, eager to see past our own windows fogged with lace. We've brought a toaster stuck with a bow and dollar bills to pin to the groom's tie. Cameras flash. The newlyweds flicker like a constellation at the head of the aisle. A strange music rises to our ears like coins in a drain, indecipherable as the whales before they died out. We watch, wondering if it'll last. Confetti drops like predicted weather from the sky. Um, a couple of years ago, I bought this plane ticket to Haiti. I was gonna go for Thanksgiving, and I, I wrote an email really excitedly to some friends there who were working for an NGO, and I got this email back that was practically in all capital letters telling me, do not come, this is a bad time, um, we don't travel unless we're in convoys, and you know the situation isn't really welcoming to random tourists. Um, so I canceled the trip, but I always felt a little bit like I'd given in too easily to this idea of danger. Um, so this poem kind of came from that. And I'm not sure if this poem is is um, toying with um, the fantasy of, of, of danger in third world places or, or what exactly, but I'll just share it. It's called, What If You'd Gone Anyway? Just to sense the lift off, body clenched, anchored, like a stone in a fist, then light, heart in your mouth, ears agog, stomach churning away at a packet of nuts, a few sips of something with kick. Wanting nothing more than to fumble like a clumsy janitor with the wrong set of keys, to pause and decipher signs like, down with the expensive life, God is good, buy something stupid. 
you'd have taken your first few steps through customs, past the caravan of orphaned bags on their ceaseless loop, back behind the black rubber drapes and out again like ham actors, then maybe stopped short, wondering whether anyone had seen you, whether anyone's hand closed around a sharp object deep in the pocket of a superfluous coat. If there really are people who can tell a stranger not from what you say or the mark of your shoes, but from how light behaves after it hits your skin, they're probably so good they need only walk up to you empty-handed and command. Come with me. No threats, just fact. You have what I need. You are what I need. And knowing they're right, you obey. Fear resembles desire. Even when the message is wrong, even when someone you owe nothing leans in, handles you as if once in another life maybe you belonged to him. Sometimes now you imagine riding slumped in the back of that car as it speeds through the slums toward some dim room where you're shoved into a chair or strung up to a pipe that gurgles, idiot, fool, under its breath. You imagine the shadows charging in and out of the doorway, arguing protocol. They're young, hyped up on something, hungry, shouting because nobody's listening. You duck your head when they raise their fists. You stoop in this place where anyone who grows too tall is hacked right down. I guess I'll just read a couple more poems. Um, let's see. This poem is called Reality. And um, the only little detail that might be interesting is uh, in Rome, and I'm sure in lots of other places, but in the winter, there are these huge clouds of starlings that you can see in the sky, um, making these really beautiful sort of um, undulating patterns that are pretty mesmerizing. And you can actually Google on YouTube starlings in Rome and, and see these film clips of this happening. So there's a reference to that toward the end of this poem. Reality. If I had to say, I'd call it the valley where a lead of foxes swirls in ambush, or the rapid loops an owl sears into the sky at dusk. It is heavy in the way starlings seem for an instant heavy as they herd and swell, their dark mass now a clot, now merely the shadow of a shape, distant, diminished, gone a presence that slips in and out of its own name, not shy, but quick, quicker than our way of naming what we know, quicker than our knowing. Sometimes I'd say it seems like what sings out from what the fox drags back to its den, or the branches where the wind hauls what the owl wrote. Sometimes it is merely the silence smudged onto the window in Rome, against which someone has pressed her wrapped, round face, squinting out. And I'll end with this poem, which is called Willed in Autumn. The room is red, like ourselves on the inside. We enter and my heart ticks out its tune of soon, soon. I kneel on the bed and wait. The silence behind me is you, shallow breaths that rustle nothing. This will last. I grip the sheets, telling time to get lost. I close my eyes so the red is darker now, deep a willed distance that backs away the faster we approach. I dream a little plot of land and six kid goats. Every night it rains. Every morning sun breaks through and the earth is firm again under our feet. 
I am writing this so it will stay true. Don't leave. Go for a while into your life, but meet me come dusk at a bar where music sweeps out from a jukebox choked with ragged bills. We'll wander back barefoot at night, carrying our shoes to save them from the rain. We'll laugh to remember all the things that slaughtered us a lifetime ago, and at the silly goats, greedy for anything soft enough to crack between their teeth. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much, Tracy. Thank you, everyone, for being here. We do have Tracy's books for sale, and we'll see you in February. <laughs>